Good morning, afternoon, just about. We're 10 minutes away. How's everybody doing? Awesome. Corey Hunsberger, Pastor Corey Hunsberger, burned the barn down last week with that message. Great message. Wow. I loved it, and I told them this week, I said, why do you get all the good, easy stuff, and I got to tackle the next portion of Scripture that's so difficult? He says, because you the daddy. That's what he said. <laughs> so funny. Hey, let's pray, and uh, we'll get into the Word. Father, we love you, Jesus. We worship you. Thank you so much for how good you are. And Lord, I pray for your grace upon this message. Lord, that your presence would continue to fill this place, and that there would be no distraction. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Lord, we just ask for your liberty. And as I preach the word, would you help my heart to connect to yours, my mouth to speak what you're saying, and cause our hearts to be um, soft so we can receive. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're in part three in Romans. And uh, um, we were supposed to already be in chapter three uh, right now. And we're still in the first chapter. So how many of you know this is going to go more than 14 weeks? Amen. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, if you'd go there. I want to talk to you today about the bad news and then the good news. So if you get offended, look right here, please, everybody. I had to tell the first service this. If you get offended at the first half of my message, hang around. Don't get up and leave because the good news is coming. So don't be like, oh, I don't agree with that and storm out of here. Because you might get a heart change as we get a little bit deeper into this message. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now everybody, put your seatbelts on, okay? Strap in, because Paul literally lays it down in the next few verses, and so be prepared. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, His, God's, invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Paul is taking Genesis chapter 1, and he's connecting it to this chapter. And there's a reason, and I'll talk about it in just a sec. Even his, uh, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into the image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. In other words, they worship creation. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshiped and served the creature rather, uh, the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forevermore. Amen. For this reason, for what reason? Because they refused to acknowledge God. For this reason, uh, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged their natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use for women, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of the error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do the things which are not fitting. Listen, it's it's very clear. He says, this is not fitting. Ready? Here we go. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, they are whisperers, uh, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil. Is the list getting worse or what? Things disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death. Not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Now, how many of you are so encouraged right now by that? (laughs) We have to understand something. The theme of, of Romans is this. The theme of Romans is Paul is showing us the righteousness of God. That is the theme. He's going, here is the righteousness of God, but Paul starts with the bad news and the bad news is the, right, the unrighteousness of man. 
So Paul, if you will, he's taking, he's saying, here, first I'm going to give you the law and the condemnation, and then I'm going to show you salvation and grace. And so it'd be as if I was up here with a big canvas, and I was painting a picture of what humanity was like. That's what Paul is doing. He's painting a picture of mankind. And some of us get stuck on the homosexual verses. Oh, you know, the church that has the signs, God hates homosexuals. Well, there's a, there's a little more in the list. You might want to look at the rest of the list, too. How come some people believe, well, I'll just take this. I, I like this, but I don't so much like this part. I'm going to take this part out, but I, I really don't want this, but, but, but I'll take this. Paul says you can't do that. Paul actually paints a picture of the unrighteousness of human beings. He says, here's what you are like. I'm going to take a portrait of you. And here's what you are like without God, without Jesus Christ. I'm going to show you right now in these verses. And so I want you to catch something. If you're taking notes, I'm going to go back to this. But if you're taking notes, I want you to understand something so when you read the word, you can, you can study this. In chapters 1, verse 18 through 32, he addresses Gentile idolatry and human flesh sinful nature, what we just read. Immorality. The sin of the Gentile world is who he was speaking to. Then in chapter 2, 1 through 16, he addresses critical moralizers. Because in the next chapter, he says, hey, you who judge, you say that this is good, but you do it yourself. So Paul wasn't saying you can't look at someone's life and go, that's bad, because obviously he just spent about 16 verses telling us what's up and how bad we are. So he's obviously judging something. But he's saying, you guys are you're like, you're judging moral people, but you're not moral. You're judging immorality, but you yourselves are doing it. If I say, I, I, I'm stealing, and then I go to somebody else and go, you're a jerk, you're a sinner, you steal, what am I? I'm a hypocrite. That's what Paul addresses. Chapter 2, 17 uh, through chapter 3, verse 8, he addresses self-confident Jews. He puts the argument out, hey, you guys say you're Jews, therefore the law was given to you. You don't have to live for God because you're just in. And Paul basically says, you're, you're out too. You're, you're a sinner too. And then chapter 3, verse 9 through 20, he lays it down and he addresses the whole human race. Don't you love that? You're like reading that and you're like, wow, man, uh, the sin of homosexuality is bad. But if you read the rest of the list, guess what? You don't get to escape it. Isn't it funny how we, we like to judge our hearts and our lives to somebody else's because it makes us feel better? Well, I'm not a homosexual. Yeah, but you're an adulterer. Well, I'm, I'm not an adulterer. Yeah, but you're a liar. Well, I'm not a liar. Yeah, but you covet. Well, I don't covet. And you start to say, I'm better than somebody else. And then somebody comes along and goes, yeah, but, yeah, but you're unmerciful. Do you get the picture? Like Paul's creating an escape proof. You can't get out of the judgment. And so he's coming to them saying, look, you're all in this situation. And until we recognize, you guys, listen to this, until we recognize that we are sinners and that we have, not, we have nothing before God, we can't receive the gift of grace. We can't receive the cross. We can't receive forgiveness. The only way to receive forgiveness is to come to God and say, watch this, your assessment of my life is right. If you say that I'm a sinner, then I'm a sinner. God, I have a problem with lying. If you say that lying is a sin, well, here I am before you. I say to you, I am a sinner and I am a liar. And he goes, awesome, already knew that. You ever, you know, when I first got saved, it was awesome, long-haired kid, you know, playing in rock bands, and, and I got saved, and I was like, wow, and, I, and over about a month and a half, I stopped cussing as much, because I would cuss when I witnessed to people, you know, <laughs> and this older guy in the church, thank God for an older guy that wasn't a Pharisee, he said, Rick, I love your passion for Jesus, but it, you'd probably get a little farther along if you wouldn't use so much profanity when you're telling people about Jesus. <laughs> So I, I began to move, and I stopped uh, smoking marijuana, and I stopped drinking beer, and I stopped doing all those things, and I was like, wow, so cool. And then as I started to grow in the Lord, so it was, now we're going to look on the inside. What do you mean, Lord? 
Now we're going to deal with you. Those were outward expressions of, of sin. But I want you to, I know that I need Jesus more now than I did the day I got saved. I am more desperate for Jesus right now than the day I came to him because I understand what the Bible says, blessed are those who mourn. Who mourn what? They mourn their condition that they are bankrupt without God. You're blessed when you come to the position of going, I really am a sinner. I'm jacked up. And the Lord goes, yes. Listen to this. Matthew uh, chapter 2, verse 15. Now it happened, so Jesus is at Levi's house, right? Now it happened as he was dining in Levi's house that many tax collectors and sinners, I love, hold on a second, if you work for the IRS, cool, but I, I, I love how the, the Bible separates tax collectors and sinners, like, like tax collectors were worse than sinners, you know what I mean? And they also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with tax collectors and sinners, there we go again, they said to his disciples, how is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now listen to what Jesus was not saying. Hey, Pharisees, good job. I love the way you're dressed right now. Um, I'm digging the way that you walk out your life. Uh, you're fasting, the way you wash your hands before meals, all that stuff. I want you to know, though, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't come for you, the righteous. I came for these guys who are sick and need me. That's not what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying, hey, Pharisees, come here. I didn't come to call the righteous because there are none. But the Pharisees probably, you know, maybe they had those great... Duck Dynasty beards, you know. <laughs> and Jesus was talking, and they were like, mm, yes, yes, sinners. You've, you've come to call them, not me. And they've walked out without being changed. The Son of God looking at them dead in the eyeballs, and they fully miss the point. Jesus was saying this, no one is righteous. None. Matter of fact, even as we've walked with the Lord, my righteousness is from Jesus. I don't have righteousness in myself. The Bible says that our flesh is as, our sinful nature, our righteousness is as a filthy rag. So you can't earn it. You don't deserve it. But God came in his son Jesus and he poured out grace upon you. But you have to understand and recognize who you are. I had a friend who... Uh, he was having pain, and about four months into this pain, he told me, hey, I have pain, and I'm like, man, it hurts. And I was like, well, go to the doctor. So he goes to the doctor, and he comes back, white as a ghost. Good man, I have cancer. And I said, oh, man, and he said, and here's, here's the bummer. My wife told me to go to the doctor four months ago when I first started having pain, and the doctor said, had I come four months ago, I wouldn't be this bad, and he died six months later. Done. And I said, oh, man, I'm going to get a checkup. Some of us are so afraid of the diagnosis. But I tell you what, I'm more afraid of the consequences of the diagnosis than I am of the diagnosis. So when the Lord says to me, son, you have sin in your life, I don't go, no, I don't. You ever had pain somewhere and you just ignore it? My kid, when he was little, he has a very high, high pain tolerance, even still. He... He's, he's a little bitty guy, and he's in his bedroom playing, and I come home from work, and I walk in, and he's playing. He's like, hey, Dad. You know, he's got snot coming down his nose, and his head is bright red and sweaty, and I'm like, what is wrong with this boy? So I reach down, and, you know, there's a spot on their back where I can just tell he's got a fever. So I reach down to the back of his shirt, and I'm like, buddy, you have a fever. And he goes, no, I don't. I said, honey, you do. So we got a thermometer, and we, pff, and we, 103. And I'm like, the kid has such high pain tolerance. And then he says to me, what do you want to do, Daddy? You want to go outside and play? I said, you're sick. You need to get in bed. No, I'm not. Because he didn't want to miss out on the fun. So he was afraid to say who he really was in that moment. 
And God's saying to us, here's the condition of who you are. You're all broken and completely messed up, every one of you. From the rich to the poor, you are all under the same sentence of Adam. And so let's tackle these issues. Are you ready to tackle some stuff? Because the Bible says this, that God has problems with people who suppress the truth. And suppressing the truth, they became unwise. How do you become unwise? Suppress the truth. What does that mean? To hold the truth back to ignore it. I don't want to hear about Jesus. I don't want to hear about problems. I don't want to hear that I'm a sinner because I'm enjoying my life even though I've got a raging fever. And the Lord says, don't suppress the truth. Matter of fact, set the truth free in your life. Let truth come alive in you because it is the thing that will heal you. So let's look at some of these issues of homosexuality. Oh, we're going to talk about that? Listen, it is the hot button of the day in our culture. Do you agree? And there are many pastors who will not touch this subject. They won't talk about it from the pulpit. They refuse to talk about it. Some of my buddies are like, you're going to talk about it? Yes. We're going to smash the button. Here's why. Because if we don't talk about it, then we're ignoring truth and suppressing it. We've become just like this. And I will not suppress the word of God. I won't do it. And it's not like I'm the hero of my own story. I will not suppress the truth. I won't suppress the truth because, number one, it honors the Lord when we live in truth. Number two, I care about you and I love you enough to tell the truth because the condition of your soul is important to me. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to, oh, throw a bunch of powdered milk out here and make you go, oh, that's good. That's tasty. And nothing ever changes on the inside of you. Because truth doesn't get a chance to penetrate you. Well, you're welcome, Ken. (laughs) Listen, what is the deal here? He says they basically suppress the truth, they deny their creator, and he ties it back to Genesis chapter 1. He's saying creation testifies. And then he uses a word that's very interesting. He uses the word what is natural. Now, I, there are children here today, yes? So if I was alone with you, I'd go way deep on the medical part of this that is, would, would not be appropriate in this setting, would not be appropriate for your children to hear. But there are natural things about homosexuality, look right here, that is unnatural. It doesn't go with nature. There, and you can go figure it out, go at home, Google it, and be careful what you pull up, but there are things that are naturally, not. it's not natural. And that's what Paul addresses. He goes, men are putting aside women for their natural use so that they can be with one another and it's unnatural. So why would the Lord be so against this and oppose this? I'll tell you why. Because God, here, okay, we're going we're to back this up a little bit. I'm preaching this out of a different order than last service. What is wrath? And how do you get God to be wrathful? Are you ready for this? Wrath is God's deep hatred of darkness and evil, not people. God hates the devil with a passion. And Jesus came and overcame him. And in the book of Revelation, there will come a day that all evil will be destroyed by the Lord. It will be done and out of our life. So why does God get so intense about this stuff? I'll tell you why. Because he loves people and he says, they receive the penalty of their error. So if I take my hand and I put it in a car door and I go, go for it, Cindy. Go for it. Slam her. And she goes, boom. And I go, yeah, why did you do that? Right? Well, you asked me to. Listen, if I do that, the law says that's going to crush my hand. And God, the reason why he hates this, this particular sin is because he knows it destroys people's lives. It's out of love. How can a loving, perfect, loving God be wrathful? Because he hates darkness. How can a father love his son perfectly but hate stuff in his life that's destroying him? Easily. How many of you are fathers? Raise your hand. Come on. If I walked into my son's room and he was listening to some music or was like, kill your mother, kill your father, guess what I would probably do? I'd say, hey, bud, come here for a sec. I want to... Turn that off for a minute. What are you doing? This is cool, man. 
no, no, it's not cool. First of all, don't kill me and your mother. That's the first thing I want to say. <laughs> first truth. Second of all, do you understand that the stuff that you're putting into your mind right now is entering into your soul? And I care about your soul so much that I despise and hate that thing that's trying to pull you down. I love you with all my heart, but I hate the evil that's trying to get inside of your life and destroy you. Because, son, there's going to be penalties. Because the Bible says that sin has a consequence. Even though we're forgiven of our sins, and God does heal things, and God does, d- does deal with stuff. But listen, there's people that love Jesus that have sinned powerfully, man. They go out and do something, and they go, yeah, I'm forgiven. Yeah, but there is a whole entire mess in your trailer now. You're dragging around with you because of the consequence. And then people say, well, wait, wait, but, but I was born this way. Can we talk about it? Can we just be cool and just, just talk about it? Instead of like, we're going to hide from it, nobody wants to talk, we're talking about it. God made me this way. I have uh, uh, two relatives who were uh, in the lifestyle of homosexuality, and for 10 years or so, we prayed for them, that they would know the love of God, and when we saw them, we weren't like, oh, get away. We were like, hey, come here, love you, how you doing, you doing all right? You see... The people that have the signs, God hates homosexuals. First of all, not true. He hates that sin. He loves that person. So this is wrong. Matter of fact, I want to go to those people. Oh, I wish I could just talk to that pastor for an hour. One hour, me and him in a room. Just, you know what I'm saying? (laughs) So why don't you take your fancy sign that says God hates homosexuals and put liars on it? And storm around the mall. <laughs> God hates liars. Or, or how about this? God hates unmerciful people. God hates unmerciful people. God hates stealers. I'm not talking about the football team. <laughs> but apparently he doesn't like the Niners too much. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that was a bit of a harsh game to watch. He likes the Seahawks, apparently. Uh, Sorry, that was wrong. <laughs> Erase. Here we go. So we've got the sign up. God hates, God hates. And I say to people, uh, so do you think that because you're out with your sign saying God hates homosexuals, that somehow you're getting in with the Lord and he likes you? What about you, uh, pastor? Um, what are you, what's your issue in life? What, what, did, what did Adam do to you? What? Yeah, because see, God didn't make anybody that way. Adam did when he sinned and fell. When Adam sinned and fell, it, it, it put all of us into the category of sin, and there's a natural bend towards, listen, I know guys who love beautiful women, and they're married, and they like to be with other beautiful women. Guess what? Eh, wrong answer. Yeah, but God made me this way. I can't help my, I've talked to guys. Oh, I can't help myself. They're so beautiful. And, oh, my wife, my, you know, I, 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 you know, I kind of, I love my wife. I want to be with her. But, man, there's all these beautiful women. And I go, L- I'm going to break it down to you, bro, right now. I'm going to give you the way to overcome this. Are you ready? He goes, yeah, give it to me. Just say no. <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah, there's the principle we're going to get into later on. It's called the resisting principle that Paul talks about. We're all called to fight daily against sin in the good fight of faith. Guess what? There's things in my life that my sinful nature wants, and I have to restrain myself and say to myself, no. Why? Because adultery hurts families. Stealing hurts families. Lying kills people. The Ten Commandments are the tender commandments. Because God said, don't have other gods before me. It'll ruin you. Don't go after your neighbor's wife. It'll hurt their families. Yeah? Man, I've talked. How many of you, if I said, um, tomorrow, I'm going to go find another woman, which I love my woman. She's sweet. I love her deeply. And I go, well, I'm going to just go find another woman, another wife. And I came back to the church and said, hey, listen, the Lord brought some other woman into my life. She makes me super happy. She's my soulmate. And uh, (laughs) we're we're going to, I'm going to divorce Cindy and I'm going to marry this other woman. 
By show of hands, how many of you would not be okay with that? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, yes. Uh, she's really not okay, apparently. You know who's not okay with it? The Lord. And that's who I'm living for. There's a pastor who 10,000 people in his church decided that him and his wife weren't going to be together anymore. Another woman, another man. And actually went before their church with some sloppy letter about how they, they just tried to shine it over. And, and you know, it's like you just go to them and say, hey, bro, come here a second. I have a word from the Lord for you. Are you ready? And by the way, their whole church was good with it. They were good. And I was like, come here, man. I, I, got, I got a word from the Lord. Are you ready? You're sinning against the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Watch. You can't say that. You can't judge that man. You don't live in his shoes. You can't say that that's bad and that's wrong. No, I, I really, 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 I, really, I can't. It's in the Bible. <laughs> you see, we've allowed so many other things to be, become our measuring stick. We're like tuning our piano to someone else's piano, and you never do that. You tune a piano to a tuning fork. Yep. So Jesus is the bomb. Right? And the world's going down here. And I go like this with the word of God. I read it and it tunes my heart, man. And it, and it confronts me. And I say, this is sin. This is wrong. And it's not, God, you don't love me because you're, you're, you're coming against me and my things that I want to do. You see, no, he loves me so much that he will confront me. And I, that verse at the very end scares the heck out of me. It says, hey, man, the people that live like this, and you actually approve of them living like this, you're actually sharing in their sin. Whoa. So when you go, oh, that girl's a nice girl. Yeah, she's living a, a gay lifestyle, but she's so sweet. Listen, we're not talking about sweetness. Do you hear me? Yes. We're not talking about talent, sweetness, good people, nice to people. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about God's righteous standard. And his truth, and the Bible says the truth, you'll know the truth and it'll set you free. Or you suppress the truth and you become like this, you become hard-hearted where God can't speak to you anymore. So listen, if, if there's people in here that struggle with homosexuality, look, I, I, hear me, struggle with it. I had a guy one time, he said, oh man, this guy's so nice, he loves Jesus so much, he's prophetic, he's awesome, he's homosexual. And I go, well, let's go, let's go talk to him. Hey, dude. Love Jesus, sweet. So when are you going to resist the sin in your heart? When are you going to resist sin? Like I had to resist sin when I got up this morning. Why is it that you get a get out of jail car free and I have to submit myself to the word of God and to all these other verses? Why is it that this we're going to take out but we're going to leave these in? You know why? Because it makes us comfortable. Here's the bad news. The bad news is if they, can, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm just going to say it. If we continue to live in sin, the Bible says, we don't have part with him. Doesn't mean we don't sin. It just means that we're not living in it. Like, it's okay, Lord. You, you understand me, right? You know I'm this way. He goes, I do know you're that way. That's why I died. That's why I poured out my spirit. That's why I give you grace. That's why I have a relationship with you because I want to give you power that sin won't dominate you. Do you understand this? Whew, that's tough. This isn't a cute message. This isn't some funsy ones where we walk away with a little, little chill up and down our spine. This is like real stuff. And I've had people leave my church over this issue because I say this. And here's what I say. God bless you. I love you. But I will not stand up here and say things that are not true. Amen. I won't do it. Yeah, thanks. And I, I, don't, I, I don't need that applause. It doesn't like make me go, yeah, winning, winning. <laughs> no, watch. I know my Father in heaven. Amen. He's pleased. When we stand for the Lord and we stand for righteousness, He is pleased. And when I sin, 
He loves me, and he comes to me and says, son, please stop doing that. You're going to kill yourself doing that. It's going to hurt your life. No, I'm better. I know what I'm doing. I want to be the man that comes before the Lord and says, however you feel about me is true. Because here's the good news. When we stand before Jesus on judgment day, whatever he says about us is right and true. We're not going to be able to go, my second amendment right, my first amendment right, Lord. And he's going to go, yeah, great. You know what? True. You have the freedom to do whatever you want to do. You are free to do that doesn't make it right to do it. Just because I'm free to do something doesn't mean it's right to do something. My wife said, no, I don't want you to do that. I don't want to do that either. It's just an example. But here's the deal. I can do that. I could leave tomorrow, go find another woman, start doing whatever I want to do, and the police will not come and arrest me. No popos coming to my house. Come here, son. Get on your hands and knees. Get on. What? What? You're committing adultery? No cop does that. Why? Because it's the legal right of an American. Doesn't mean that it's right. When, just because we can doesn't mean we should. Amen? So here's the good news. Hang on. Here's the good news. When Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says this in Romans, the verse we just read. I, want, I just want you to hear this. For, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first, also for the Greek. Now, get your pencils out, because we're going to underline something, and circle something, and dot it. For in it, stop, the three words, for in it. Circle those words, and ask yourself this question, what is it? What is it? For in it, the righteousness of God is is revealed. What is it? For in what? The gospel of Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God is revealed. What does that mean? That means this. All y'all that are under the curse of the law of sin and death, which is the entire human race, you can be free. You can be righteous. Look right here. When I come to Jesus and I say, Lord, yeah, you're right. Forgive me. He doesn't go, uh, prove it. He goes, forgiven. My righteousness is on you. When the father looks down on little Ricky Fry, playing his guitar in the back, you know what he looks down? You know what he sees? He sees the blood of Jesus. Because the Bible says that when we come to Christ, we are clothed with robes of righteousness. Watch this. That don't come from within us. They come from without. They come from the Lord. So I am righteous. I'm in my snuggie, if you will, of righteousness because of the blood of Christ. His blood makes me righteous. Listen, I don't go to the Lord and pray like this. Well, Lord, today, if you remember, I was at Safeway. And there was a lady that was really old. Remember her, Lord? Super old. And I helped her put the dog food into her cart. Remember that? And then when I was driving on the freeway about an hour later, remember that guy was going to cut me off and I just went ahead and didn't get irate and I just let him cut me off. Remember that, Lord? And then when I got home, remember how nice I was to my wife? Now you have to hear me when I pray. I've earned it. And the Lord says, Buddy, you could never possibly earn who I am and what I've done for you. You could walk as many old ladies across the street as you want. You could buy all the Girl Scouts cookies when they come to your door, which I do. How many of you? Amen? Come on. <laughs> those thin mints, those little demon cookies. Ooh. <laughs> little demon, little girls in their little demon suits. I'm like, go away in the name of Jesus. Here, give me some cookies before you go. Do you, do you get where I'm going? It's, isn't it cool that we're all under the same exact judgment? You're not more special, and I'm not more special. The only time we become super special is when we say, I need Jesus. And he goes, you're covered. You're mine. You're clean. You're righteous. You don't have to walk around like a Pharisee because, you know what, you're okay, you're righteous. Now let me heal you. For in it, in what? 
in the good news of Jesus, the righteousness of God was revealed. Well, how was it revealed? His blood was spilt so that you and I could be forgiven. Pastors don't talk about the blood of Jesus much today. I've tried to find lots of sermons on him. It's real hard to find a sermon about the overcoming power of the blood of Jesus. You can find a million sermons about how to become rich and wealthy and the, and the different verses on God making you happy and rich, but you don't find much about the blood of Christ anymore. His blood was spilt for you. There's a great song that I love, and I'm going to end with this. There's this guy I listen to named Paul Allen, and uh, he's a Christian guy. Nobody knows who he is because he's too good to be in the regular Christian market. And uh, anyway, that's just my little slap in the face to the Christian. Anyways, we're good. (laughs) And he has this line in his song, and it says, Put down the bottle. Forget about yesterday. Because he bled for you, he died for you. And I just thought, that is a powerful line. He's talking to, obviously, somebody who's struggling with alcoholism. And he says, put down the bottle. Forget about yesterday. He bled for you. He died for you. Listen, he did bleed for you. He did die for you. Yep, you. Even the one in this room that says there is no God. Well, he believes in you, so you're in trouble. It's about time that you and I decide. And listen, let's, this is how we're going to deal with the homosexual issue. We're going to love people. I'm not going to be critical. There was a man that lived right next door to me, literally from me to the front row, was his yard. And his name was David. And he was 6'4", 6'3", muscle-bound, very handsome man. And he moved from San Francisco to Anderson, California, where we were living. And one day I noticed he was walking up the driveway and he was super dizzy. And like, I was like, wow, man, I wonder what's going on with that guy. I was in high school. And he came home and they took him to the hospital and he was diagnosed with AIDS, full blown. And I watched a man literally disintegrate in front of my eyes over seven months. I mean, literally disintegrate. And he would lay in his yard, I can still picture it, in his lawn chair. He would lay in his yard, and my mom, the most merciful woman I've ever met, would open our front door, turn the speakers to our, to our sound, to our stereo, outside, and she would play worship music. And he would lay there, and I would kind of watch him, and he would just soak it in. And then we would go out to him and be like, hey, David, how are you feeling today, man? We'd give him a hug, tell him we loved him, pray for him. My mom would minister to him, life to him. That's how you deal with people that are in trouble. This is not what you do when he's laying there receiving the penalty of his error that just doesn't look quite as bad as the penalty of your error. And he's, you've got your sign, God hates you, you deserve this. You know, you deserve it too, according to God. You deserve trouble too. But we are putting down the sign and we walk over to people and in the love of Jesus, we minister peace and grace and life to them and we minister to them the love of God and the mercy of God. Amen? Amen. We don't judge and critical and get all crazy. We speak truth and love. That's how this church is gonna handle that. We love people, period. But we will not withhold the truth because that is not love. Suppressing truth, the Bible says, is not love. It's, it's loving for my doctor to say to me, remember the story I told at Christmas Eve about the cancer I had on my arm? And the one guy couldn't figure out what it was. And then finally the old retired guy saw my arm and he goes, hey, come here, and he gives me a shot and takes it out. I wasn't mad at him. I was grateful. I actually said, thank you. If I would have let that go for months and months and months, that could have killed me. Thank you, Doc, for putting the Novocaine in me that hurt and scooping that out and kind of freaking me out a little bit and then cauterizing it. My flesh was smoking in your midst. (laughs) Thank you. You saved my life. I didn't go, you're judging me. You're judging me, Doc. I don't have cancer. You're judging me. He goes, no, I'm not judging you. I'm telling you the truth. I don't want to suppress this because it'll take your life. Amen? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. 
You're so good. Lord, I want to thank you that you don't pull punches, that you completely paint the picture of who we are. But then, God, on the other side of that portrait is another picture that Jesus, you did on the cross. You took a mess and made it blessed, God. You, you took stuff that was completely messed up and you forgave. And Lord, we're all in that process of being healed and redeemed. God, we thank you today for the righteous gift that's been poured on every person in this room by the love of God. And I want to go through this room. We do this at every service. Starting way over on your left. If you just say, I, man, wow, I didn't realize that God, God put that condemnation on the whole human race. But I also didn't realize that Jesus came and took that condom away, condemnation away and gave me righteousness. I want to be forgiven. I want to love and know God. If that's you, I'm just going to come through with my eyes. And if you say, I need Jesus in my heart, would you raise your hand up just so I can see it? I'm moving my eyes right now. I say, I need the Lord in my life. I'm coming through. And if you need to rededicate your life, I'm just going to move through this audience. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Yes, sir. Good. Anyone else? Say, I need the Lord in my, in my heart today. I'm coming through in this whole place, right in the center, coming out of your right. You say, I need Jesus, man. Please pray for me. I need the Lord in my life. Yeah, good. Anybody else? Say, I need the Lord today. Yeah. Excellent. Father, thank you for those that raised their hand. God, would you touch them even where they sit? May the heavy weight of condemnation be broken and may the grace and the love of God fill their hearts. May their sin be forgiven. God, thank you that you love us because we're a mess without you. Lord, we're a mess with you, but thank you that you love us through the mess and you heal us from the mess. We don't need to be afraid of it because God, you know. But Lord, I thank you that by faith, Right now, we are righteous before Jesus. We are righteous before the Father. And we live that out and we declare it. And as we worship you, Lord, in this last song, as we stand before the living God and thank you and sing truth to you about who you are, I'm asking for the presence of the Lord to so consume us that, God, we would not help but to love you and to love others. Make East Bay Foursquare Church a place where, God, you are honored, loved, and welcomed, and make us a net for your kingdom to capture lives for Christ. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's rise up.